Would you all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to go a little bit out of order, and I just made that decision about three seconds ago. Um, I'm going to move the consent agenda now, if this is okay with the committee. <laughs> is there any item that anyone on the committee would like to remove from the consent agenda? <coughs> Could we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Could we have a second? <laughs> Can I just mention that the February 25th minute, minutes are not included in here? I didn't have the thing. That okay. They have not been completed yet. Okay, thank you. So we'll need to remove those for next time. Okay. So we're approving the minutes of February 11th. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience right now who would like to address the committee on any item not on tonight's agenda? Um, a couple of things. Under um, chairperson's remarks and business, I would like to um, ask if there is anybody here who would like to address the school committee on the budget on anything that was not covered last week. Um, this would be the time that you could do that. I have four letters. I am not going to read them, but um, I have four letters that I am going to hand um, to Sandy so that we have them on record. And um, they are from James Allen, Michelle Britt Thompson, who's a, James Allen is a teacher the high school, Michelle Britt Thompson is a parent in Newberry. Um, Tony McDonald Fine is also a parent and, and a teacher, a parent and a teacher. And Rebecca Bebo is the adjustment counselor at the high school. And they have all written um, letters that, again, I'm going to pass in so we have them on record. And their concerns were the same as what were referred to by most people last week as far as um, the cuts that we have proposed. Now, is there anyone in the audience that would like to? Yes, I'll explain again the timing. Three minute time. This is your one minute warning. This is time to stop. Robin's the official timekeeper. Is there anyone that would like to speak? Yes, and please identify yourself when you come up to the microphone. Dale Williams from Newberry. First, I want to recognize and thank this district for educating my two children. They've done a fabulous job through elementary school, middle school, and high school, and with one still remaining in high school. I want to thank the teachers, the staff, the administration, the coaches, everyone involved. This district has more than met our family's expectations for a quality education. Second, I want to recognize the administration and the school committee for working hard to put together this budget as you do every year, with the challenges you face. Uh, and I think you've done a great job this year with all the challenges. Thirdly, I'd like to recognize the three towns and the leaders in those towns who continuously are up against the Prop 2 and a half challenge of fulfilling a budget for their town, including uh, the school budget. And they do it uh, with all other kinds of things coming at them from new buildings needed in the town, from snow and ice budgets, to Plum Island issues and every other issue the town has faced. And I wanna recognize how hard they worked to make that work. With all of that said, the elephant in the room continues to be the lack of support by the state in funding our children's education. Ten years ago, they funded or provided this district about $8 million. This year, they're providing about $8 million. Ten years later, we are receiving the same amount of support for Chapter 70 that we received 
10 years ago. 28% of our budget in 2005 was covered from Chapter 70 funds, and now it's down to just 20% of the budget. Is it any wonder why the towns are stressed for money as it relates to education our children? 2015 appears to be a perfect storm where most costs are going up. Utilities, health care, transportation. And I'd just like to say whether you're a student in this district, whether you're a teacher in this district, whether you're a town leader in this district, whether you're the administration, whether you're the school committee, or just a taxpayer, everyone has a stake in what happens to the Triton budget because it makes up more than half of each of these towns' budgets. And if you don't care enough to stand up and contact your representatives, put pressure on Beacon Hill and the governor to say, you need to step up and help us fund our children's education. Otherwise, we're gonna be back here every March for the foreseeable future, pointing fingers at each other, pointing fingers at the town, at the school committee, at the administration, at the teachers, whoever we can point fingers at, when we all know the elephant in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as you all know, the main item on our agenda tonight is to receive and um, get information made available by the state and our insurance company as to how it affects the fiscal 16 operating budget. Before this meeting started, um, the school committee and the administration met with representatives from the three member towns in the school district so that we could um, exchange information as it relates to the budget. So um, you may be able to tell by the tone of my voice, it wasn't a really happy party or anything like that. So um, I am going to turn it over now to the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, so they can update you on the information that we received today. Uh, thank you. Can I first of all just take you through the summary of the supporting papers that we've circulated mm -hmm. uh, today? Uh, paper A is an updated revenue uh, assessment summary that uh, Brown for Jet will talk about shortly um, because the governor's budget does provide us or does provide the Department of Revenue with information that enables it to calculate the minimum contributions with the help of the DEC, uh, which has a huge impact um, on the overall shape of, of, of the budget. Um, paper B um, provides the assessment calculation from which the numbers are derived. Um, paper C um, includes some alternative spending reduction scenarios uh, to get to um, an acceptable figure. Um, you, you'll recall that the tentative budget um, was looking for an average of a little over 4% increase in, in the assessments to the towns. Um, Brian will explain that there have been two changes um, in revenue. Um, we're anticipating a lower uh, regional transport um, reimbursement than we had in the budget. Um, and chapter, uh, state chapter 70 uh, support has been reduced by $5 a student, which is a little over $13,000. Um, so, so, so the the, the revenue assessments have been been, been reduced, um, and um, and put that alongside the the impact of the minimum contributions uh, to the um, the the uh, town assessments, where the essential problem is that we were working on an average of just over four percent, whereas the the formal calculations produces a much greater spread. Uh, of, of increases, which Brian will explain. Um, it's paper D. Uh, this is a, a document that is, was integrated into the um, both budgets, the tentative and the final budget um, last year. I particularly want to draw your attention to the mean family tax bill line in the middle uh, of the, this, this document. Um, Newbury, Rowley, and Salisbury are at the top. And as you run your, your eyes down the line below, you'll see that there are many, many uh, local neighboring districts 
uh, who have very much higher tax bills than our typical uh, of our three towns now. Um, I, I pay taxes and I'd rather not pay as much as I do, um, but on the other hand, at the end of the day, we get what we, we, we pay for. So I, I thought that might be helpful uh, to compare um, our, our, our district and towns with neighboring towns. Um, at paper E, there is a listing of the uh, issues that were raised by those who spoke uh, at the public hearing and at the bottom and it's at the bottom only to save paper I didn't want to kill another tree uh, you'll see that we have identified a further 116,439 uh, dollars in uh, potential savings that we can put on the on, on the table uh, and, and the final paper provides the committee with some and, and anybody else here with some of the details of uh, high school uh, class sizes uh, that has been used to um, identify the kind of level of savings uh, that have been proposed um, here. Um, so, with that, so that you have the geography of the papers as we refer to them, uh, I'm going to ask Brian to explain in more detail uh, the bad news that we've had over the past probably six hours. <laughs> So actually, the, um, the first point that Christopher mentioned um, is our medical renewal. We did meet today, and uh, according to our rep, it's final. Uh, according to our consultant and me, I don't believe it's final. Um, I could be wrong, and it may be final, but um, we are pushing back pretty, pretty substantially. Um, at this point, uh, they're coming in with a 10.9% increase. We budgeted a 75 uh, That means an additional $148,000. Uh, on top of what we already have assumed in this budget. This budget calls for a, a collective insurance increase of about 475000 but that's for retirees, that's for actives, that's for retiree um, medics. Um, and that number isn't just a 7.5% increase, that's also a change uh, in enrollments as uh, more folks have jumped onto our plans as the ACA has, has started to play with plans. So just to, to reference um, and just to make something clear that Christopher mentioned on page E, uh, where it referenced the 116,000 in savings at the bottom, the 148,000 in medical is not assumed anywhere yet since we just got that number shortly ago. So roughly, those savings have pretty much offset the medical at this point. Um, I'm hoping we can at least drive down the medical so it's a, a true offset of that 116. Um, so that was the start of the day. Um, and as we went through the day uh, in getting the, the governor's numbers, um, they did not get any better. Um, as we had talked about, in, um, as, as Mr. Williams mentioned, um, we've had a consistent, actually we have had a dip, where we're at the same Chapter 70 level as we were over a decade ago. Um, obviously our budget has increased. Um, I believe if we were to adjust for inflation, uh, we would be getting a million to a million and a half more than we are now in Chapter 70. Um, but unfortunately that, that bears on the, the, the taxpayers and towns. Um, so what you have on these th the first two pages is actually the tentative budget as it was approved uh, two weeks ago tonight, I believe. Um, that budget um, was showing a 4.21% increase in the aggregate. The, there have been no changes to the operating expenditures of $1,341,111 on the top of page A, or it says page one at the bottom. So that is the budget we were operating from that called for the cuts to go from what was a level services budget, which would keep everything as it is today, and the cost of doing business into next year would increase about 9%. That was about two and a half million. Um, that, that figure has not changed as far as expenditures. We can talk about what has changed up, down, savings, and uh, increases. The only thing that has changed on this document is I've adjusted under revenues. You can see that there's state transportation in it, it says Mickey Vento. It, that includes uh, Mickey Vento offset is 620,000. That is a from the cherry sheet as of today. 
I might be able to adjust that. I need to, to do some calculations in regards to what our actual expenditures will be by the end of this year, because again, uh, regional transportation is a reimbursement on the prior year. So next year we're reimbursed on a percentage of this year's. That was level funded in the state budget, which obviously if everyone's spending a little more, everyone's gonna get probably the same <coughs> dollar amount, which is a lower percentage. Um, so that number, is is pretty concrete that may that may be able to adjust as we can learn a little bit more about the mckinney vento and if they've if played with that at all ryan can we just explain for everybody that mckinney vento is our responsibility of providing the cost half the cost of transporting homeless uh, children uh, to, to their regular school they are deemed homeless correct if they're homeless yeah yep. um on the chapter 70 base aid uh, that figure of 52,540, the increase, is about 13,000 less than it was in the tentative budget. In the, we assumed what the legislature, excuse me, has done the past several years, which is give a minimum of $20, $25 per pupil. Um, this, the governor's budget came out, House 2 came out with an assumption of $20 per pupil. On top of that, we are down um, a total of 55 plus three, we're, we're 51 students that were down um, overall. So um, the, there is an impact on the fact that they funded at $20 versus $25, but it's also they're reduced in the number of enrollments. So those two figures, the decrease in the regional transport and the decrease in the chapter 70, increased the assessment to the towns. Expenditure stayed the same, a little bit less revenues from the state means a little bit more of an assessment to the town. So that takes the town assessment to 1,194,648. So that's now a 4.42%. The more disturbing piece of information we received today is if you go to page B or two, the second step in the calculation per the state formula to, uh, to assess for a regional school district we start with the operating expenditures. We take off any revenues in Chapter 70 Regional Transportation, all those on the other side. Then each town pays their minimum local contribution. Newbury's uh, minimum local contribution went down by over $210,000. Rowley's and Salisbury's went up between one hundred dollars and $200,000. That is uh, because of two things. Uh, number one, Newbury's enrollment went down by 39 students last year. Rowley's went down by 15 students last year. Salisbury's went down, or went up rather, by three. So there's certainly a, a factor there based on enrollment. The bigger factor is we had a, a large Chapter 70 lesson three years ago, I believe. Gene Case, where did he go? Um, when the state started playing with effort reduction percentages. In, in the Chapter 70 formula, there is an amount of money that is set aside to take towns who are spending above their 82.5% threshold and give them some of that contribution. Past several years, they funded it at 25%. They increased the funding in this formula to 45%, which means that Newbury is further decreased a below the line deduction um, it, d again, resulting in this discrepancy. So back on page A or page one, what that does is if you look square in the middle of the page on the operating assessment, we still have that 4.42% increase, but rather than a somewhat equal, which every year it's usually everyone's plus or minus half to a percentage point from the average, but it means that Newbury has a 1.12% increase Rowley comes in just shy of 6.5% for an increase, and Salisbury comes in at 5.7% for an increase. So we find ourselves back into the situation where we have um, a very tough challenge um, if we generally work with the, the average or the highest um, assessment increase. Um, it's important to note the assessments just in the last three, in the last four years, in the, the current year into next year. Newbury's down 110 students, Rowley's down 72 students, and Salisbury's down 64 students. So in a four-year span, we're down just shy of 250 students. So 
that will absolutely continue to, to wreak havoc on this formula. Um, I don't have a solution for you right now, but um, that is the reality of the situation. And if I take you to the third page, you then have, um, on the top it says current. That is the assessments as you saw them on the previous page. Again, that assumes the same level of spending and cuts as was approved in the tentative budget. Christopher identified some additional savings. We know that's gonna be eaten up by medical. So assuming that same, that same um, assessment, tried to just give a sense of what it would take um, if we took the highest assessment and capped it at each of these figures. So if we took the highest assessment and made sure it was no higher than 5.5%, we would have to cut an additional quarter of a million dollars. If we cut the highest assessment to 4.5%, we'd be cutting over a half a million dollars. And again, again, on top of what the, the committee has already had to cut. Uh, the highest assessment at 4%, 635. The highest assessment at 3.5% would be 762,000. And if we were to cut so that the highest assessment was no higher than a 3% increase uh, to that town, which in each scenario is Rowley, uh, we'd be cutting just shy of another $900,000. So, um, I mean, that certainly sets the scene for tonight's discussion. Does anyone have on the committee have any questions or any uh, comments? Because this is our discussion right now. Any advice that we want to give to the administration? Robin? Well, I, I think we should share with the committee members who were not in the previous meeting um, the kind of tone and the sharing of information that we had with the town officials. Um, one of the things we felt was really important was for all of us to work together in this and not to point fingers and blame each other. We're in a heck of a predicament and we're not going to come to the best solution if we're fighting. Um, that's, this is a huge jump for Raleigh that they didn't expect. I think um, the selectmen shared with us that if they, um, what they could afford to um, see as an increase over last year's assessment is around $215,000. And that means that they are um, recognizing that they can raise um, the levy by 2.5%. That's the most they can under Prop 2.5. And, and then splitting any new growth between the schools and the rest of their um, departments. They're looking at we know we, we have to talk override because if it can't come out of their general operating budget, then they're looking at, with this current budget, a $350,000 override. What I want the public to understand and the and committee members, not to say that you don't, is that um, the budgets have to pass in two out of three towns in order for us to get whatever we vote on next week. If that fails, we go back to this year's budget which means we're looking at $2.7 million in cuts. So we have a gamble in front of us. We need to decide by next week what our operating budget's going to be, knowing it's either going to require, require overrides in all three towns or several of the towns, and we won't know the outcome of that till May. So it's a challenge because we almost we have to guess what will pass in an override if it does pass and if it doesn't we're back to a very bleak outlook if we need this is again this is a time for the committee to give any kind of guidance any kind of suggestions ask any questions of the administration this is this is the time to do that dina deb i don't know how you want to do this because i spent a tremendous amount of time going through this budget, as I'm sure we all have, line by line. I have four questions that I'd like to ask and then four recommendations. Do you want to take it one by one, or how, how do you want to do this? You have four questions. Four questions, four ask, recommendations. Ask you. I would go ahead. OK. Um, the first question I had is for the data network solution listed in the budget. It says it's $50,000. But it was noticed that th noted that this could be decreased to about 35, because we were still in negotiations with Con with Comcast. Has that it is been resolved? Stand at, it is going to stand right around 50,000. Okay, it is. All right. 
Another thing that in our, our workshop we had talked about possibly dimming the lights in the halls to the safe passage lighting. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's been any consideration given to that and what the cost savings might be. We've been discussing that for five years. Uh, the difficulty is that the way that the building is set up is, is that we can certainly da turn it down to safe passage and we try to do that when students are not around. But in the evening when, when the cleaners come, uh, that they, the way that they, they organize the cleaning, uh, you often see lots and lots of, of lights on. Um, certainly I, 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 it won't be very pleasant. I think we could go down to safe passage all, all the time but it won't be a very pleasant environment. Do we know what the cost savings would be? Is it even worth doing it at the risk of safety? I, I haven't got a figure. <coughs> can, I, can I say that I, I think that we're going to have to go back and take a root and branch look at this bu budget, given the kind of magnitude of the savings that, that uh, we're talking about. Uh, I, I think that the, the design of the budget is probably going to have to change. Um, the, there are five elements in the design at the moment. I don't think they will all survive. Uh, wh wh whatever figure you give us as a, as a, as a, as a target. But certainly, uh, Chris Walsh and I and Brian have regular conversations about the difficulty of keeping the lights down. Okay. Um, next question I won't ask. It has no bearing on the budget for next year. But um, in the budget, it says that there was an increase in kindergarten salaries at NES and Pine Grove, but the number of classes wasn't changing. Can you tell me why that is? That was a salary that was charged to school choice that I had to pull out because school choice won't support it. The it was Pine Grove was the other one, about 32000 mm -hmm. That was pulled out of, uh, previously was funded by the full day K revolving account, and that account hasn't been able to support it anymore. Okay, thank you. Now, can I continue with my recommendations, Deb? First, I want to preface this by saying that I put a lot of thought into this. None of the recommendations that I am proposing tonight are ideal by a long shot. Um, I'll start with what I think is the easiest one. And, and, and I'd also like to say that at the, the hearing last week, I was really glad to see so many of the, the teachers and, and parents here, more teachers than, than I've seen, I think, ever in my, in my 10 years on the committee, that showed up for a budget meeting that was on academics, as Robin had pointed out last week, not, not because it was a mu music program or whatever, which I think is fabulous. I mean, I, I know that your heart is in it no matter what, but I am glad to see that, that we had so many people involved. Um, one thing that the school committee did when we voted the, the tentative budget was we recommended putting in the PE position that we had originally cut. Um, the thinking was if we did that, the uh, health policy that we had approved that night, that it would be used to support that. But since that policy will not be in place for next year, I'm recommending that we look at cutting that PE position again, especially if we are looking at trying to get a waiver for junior and senior um, athletes, that um, it might be a way to control some costs. Um, one thing that um, I thought about doing too, again, the, none of these were easy to come to, um, recommend eliminating the one professional development day with cost savings going to reinstate the literacy specialists at Newberry Elementary in Pine Grove. I will say, and I said to Margot prior to this meeting, that her presentation last week with all the, the hard facts that she gave us. It, we got it in an email as well, and being able to look at that email, not just the notes that I took that night, because unfortunately I don't think Margo was able to finish her presentation to the extent that she would have liked to, but looking at that information really proved to me that these are important positions in those elementary schools. And, and to me, it was a matter of looking, you know, we're always talking about looking down the road to do cost savings down the road. To me, as we've discussed before, literacy is a big piece of, of education. And to me, it only makes sense that an elementary education is just that. It's elementary. It sets the foundation for the rest of your learning. And if we, can't, if we can catch these kids with learning difficulties early on, it's probably going to save us time and effort as they move into the higher grades of the elementary, into the middle school, and, and even into the high school. 
Um, the, there are two other positions that I am recommending that we look at possibly eliminating. One would be the differentiation coach. Not that I don't think that this is unimportant, but I do believe that I know for the past several years, differentiation has been a topic for the teachers for their professional development. Um, personally, I think that that's what good teachers do anyway. Um, I think that maybe some of the mentoring, and I could be wrong in this, I'm not, I'm not a teacher, I'm not in these schools all the time, but I, I do think that maybe the mentoring that teachers do with one another could help to fill in any gaps that new hires might have. Um, and it might be a way of, of cutting some costs right now. The other one is the um, curriculum coordinator's position. And again, it's not that I don't think that position is unimportant, but it seems to me that part of the job of the curriculum coordinator would be to oversee the, the uh, writing of the curriculum maps. And it's my understanding through our, our meetings um, in the last several months that these maps are pretty well done. They might be needing to be tweaked, but that they are done. Um, so, not knowing the full job description for that position, um, I think that that might be a position that we could look at eliminating or, or even consolidating with something else. And of course, if we mean consolidating, that falls on your shoulders, Kim. Which leads me to the last recommendation that I had made um, was to ask the administrators to take a pay cut. and. I'm now going to tell you that that I would like to see as a last resort um, because in, in what I'm proposing, we are asking them to do even more, as we will be the teachers as well. Um, and, and as was pointed out before, this is going to be an incredibly tough budget season for next, for next year's school year. And it's worse than any of us even imagined. Um, so I think that we need to try and get, like Robin had said before, try and get beyond looking at what's being cut and do what we need to do to do the best for our students. That's it. Thanks. Does anyone else on the committee have any suggestions or questions? Need clarification on anything? Suzanne? Um, thank you, Dina. I, I think you are, um, you are well uh, it was well thought through, and I, I'm in agreement with you, what you're we saying, so uh, thank you. Um, the only question I have is for Christopher. Um, you just mentioned that you looked at the five, you're talking about five, um, I just couldn't hear what you said, five. If you look at the tentative budget, yeah. the, the, the budget is designed around main, maintaining five elements in, in the current okay. budget. I couldn't hear elements. And so you're thinking that if we give you a number, you're going to go back and you're going to somehow tweak those five major elements or can you just explain what you meant by that it was a little well 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 vague. clearly if, if 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 one of the elements is to maintain our capacity to support um improvement then some of the issues which have just been talked about will certainly um, make that very very difficult I, i'm not saying it's not necessary under the circumstances but we need to be clear of the the consequences. Paul? I was just going to, uh, Brian, this is a question more for you, but is there any leverage that we can use uh, with the health insurer to talk about going back to the GIC? I mean, uh, that's just a suggestion uh, because th that's a hell of an increase, I think. Um, do we have leverage? Yes. I mean, we can choose to go to a different provider at any point. Um, we contract with group benefit strategies. Um, we pay them a few thousand dollars a year, and they sit by our side for every meeting we have. Um, and they sat there this morning and agreed with me that there's no way that 10.9 is reflective of the actual claims. Um, so they're going to do some work and come back. We're probably late in the game to make a change for this year. Uh, we have a public employee committee. All of the negotiations and the bargaining for health insurance was pulled out of the individual contracts. In order to make a change mid-contract, every member of the PEC has to agree to open it back up. Um, we are due to open it up again next year for fiscal 17. We're in the second year now, next year is the third year. Um, so any, any change in provider plan design is, is it's mandatory bargaining. Um, 
the the better leverage is to say, okay, if if Maya is not the option here, there are lots of other players. Um, and as Kate Cherry said this morning, there's lots of other vendors who would like our business. Um, we've had very good luck with Blue Cross. They've been a great plan. We're on the similar plans that the towns are on. Um, they are benchmark plans, GIC-like. Um, my personal preference is, is watching what's going on with the GIC. Um, this would not be the time to be jumping into the GIC. It's gotten a little crazy. Um, their, their costs have increased pretty substantially. Um, their, their core plans, they'll advertise in the single digits, but the plans that the majority of people are on are gonna see 12, 13, 14% increases, and their de plan designs are getting less rich, so much more out-of-pocket costs. Um, we will, and I can say this publicly because it's not, it, it's public information, our plans will be Cadillac plans as of full implementation of the ACA or Obamacare in 2016. So when the PEC comes together, um, we have to make some changes so that people and we are not pay paying penalties. Um, that can be offering other plans, other options. Some people would like to pay a lesser premium and have less coverage and people would have that option. So um, that's all gonna have to be taken up next year. Um, I, I, I don't believe that we have the time and, and Kate Cherry from GBS did walk away knowing that I would entertain other options if, if we could go to Blue Cross Direct or if we could go to Tufts. Um, I just don't think sitting here on March 4th with a PEC that we could get the group to open it up and then open up a full, a full RFP process and close it in time to renew. We basically have to be all done by May 1st so that they have the time to get the data, start deductions in June so that July 1st coverage begins. So. I just raised it, Brian. I appreciate all that, but I just raised it because, I mean, you know, the health insurer increase is really a pretty fluid number. You know that, and it's really a matter of they want our business, yep. and I wasn't suggesting that we try to do something midstream, but just let them know that we are in, in a world of hurt with regard to our budget, and if ever there was a time for them to get realistic with their number, and in light of at least some committee members' interest in trying to go towards a PEC and tell them that it's something that we, uh, not the PEC, but the GIC, and that that's something that we'd recommend to the PEC during our next negotiation process to try to get whatever we can back from them. That's all Absolutely. I'm trying to say. Yeah. And they're aware of that, and I can tell you that they left our office and went to another member community, and they heard the same story from them as well. So I, I think they're getting the sense that they, they have to be more competitive if they want to retain our business. Absolutely. I guess the only other thing I'd want to share with the administration about the direction of this budget is... Um, if, if there are going to be cuts, and, and there probably are, um, my preference uh, would be to work within the electives in the high school to try to consolidate classes and courses as opposed to teacher cuts in the elementary school for much the same reason that I think Dina identified that if, if we go from having you know small numbers in the elementary schools to larger numbers in the elementary schools, it's going to hurt us down the road. And, and I, it's not that I want to throw the electives teachers at the high school or the middle school under the bus. But I just think that, you know, we've been very fortunate to have the breadth of the, of the educational courses that have been offered here for a long time. And I just think that if we have to make cuts, that's how it should be done. Does anybody else have any comments? Just to, just to be clear, the cuts that, um, that Paul referred to were already in the budget. We're we were at a 4.2%, those were already there. Um, and I, I, agree with, I agree with what you said, Paul, but just so that people understand that the, the severity of the cuts beyond what we've already talked about, beyond literacy specialists, beyond sections at the high school, they're substantial, they're more than what we've talked about so far. Does the administration have anything else that you would like to say or ask? If I could ask some questions. There, there are a number of um, items um, within the budget now um, that the committee has supported. Um, and I think it would be worthwhile clarifying whether you still feel the same. One, one is the math program. Um, I raise that knowing that the whole of the administration believes it's important that we do have a math program that is aligned with the state framework. Um, th there, there is the um, school resource officer. Um, I, I know that the administration in our secondary schools feel very, very strongly 
um, that that support and it's fairly sophisticated support that the SRO provides um, in, in managing some of our most troubled um, adolescents is, is actually very, very important. Um, and there's the issue of uh, Comcast um, and whether we, we manage with an increasingly frustratingly narrow wave band. It's not got any narrow, but we have more people using it. Uh, Can I clarify one thing? Because in the newspaper it said Wi-Fi. This is not Wi-Fi. This is our internet it's provider. So it's our, our actual internet, not the Wi-Fi. <coughs> I just wanted to clarify right, that. Right, yes. It's, it's about that. I just, didn't it have to do with the phone, the safety and the, the reliability phone system of the system? would be on top system? of this. This is just the data solution. So the phone was a quarter of a million more than that. All right. So th those, those were th th three items which are in the budget and certainly will be helpful to know sooner rather than later whether you still feel the same way. Mr. Farmer, can you tell us what the cost would be? I know I remember the math was fifty, fifty thousand dollars. Correct math program. That, that's correct, unless unless um, the chief academic officer has talked the price down. She's shaking her head sadly. And can you re remind us what the school resource officer would be in the the data solution? The school resource officer is fourteen thousand, and the other one, the Comcast, is is fifty. Paul, I mean Dick, sorry. Spread that cost across the three towns for the Yes, officer. yes. Because it's in the budget, it, it, it's part of the assessment to each town. So it's spread according to the percentages. Then, Suzanne? I mean, uh, my position still stands. Uh, I think we should get rid of the math program, keep the, uh, keep the officer, and then with the Comcast, um, I don't think there's anything you can do about that. I mean, if parents and teachers want, you know, access to the internet, and that's important for the community, we have to have that. Um, if we're willing to have a slow connection, be frustrated, and not use other things to access information, um, then that's that. So I really can't give you guidance on that one. I'm assuming that that's what the community and the teachers want, and if that's what we have to do to keep, you know, <coughs> the teachers up and running, um, then that, I think that's what we have to do. I have a question about the, um, because the f math program went from 70000 down to fifty because we know we have an annual cost of 20000 to photocopy handouts because we don't have math textbooks. Um, are we going to put twenty back in then? So if we don't buy the math program, we do need to put twenty back in. So we're really talking a difference of 30000 to be able to launch the math program versus continue to use disposable throwaway materials? No, I didn't take it out of the school budget, so it would be, it's the 50 is accurate. But right. The money is but still if we, budgeted. The 20 is still in there still in, in case the school we, lines. We didn't touch that because it's come out of the school, the school lines. Okay. So. Well, I guess I just maybe would like to know more again about that math program because my concern is that math program touches K through 8. It's a program that will make our math consistent across three elementary schools. I mean, how bad is it now? Can we limp by another year with materials? Meanwhile, we've had a math committee together working and reviewing books that will be aligned with the um, current state frameworks, um, how can we wait a year? Or are we really underserving our students with delaying a math program? We did have the conversation at a recent leadership meeting where we had the discussion with principals about taking um, um, feedback from the staff regarding the math program. And all of the principals said they still support that math program in the program in the budget, excuse me, based on what the teachers um, have communicated to them about the amount of work that it is taking to pull resources together to create meaningful and aligned lessons with their students. So we did, you know, 
seek out um, additional input from teachers and um, the principals at the schools. So Kim, can I ask a qu clarifying question? Does that mean that it's, it's teacher time just to pull the information together? That doesn't mean time spent copying or any of that? No, none of that. Okay. No, it's just trying to plan the lessons. And with all the work we've done with RTI and the interventions, there's no intervention kit that comes with these programs that we're using right now. So a lot of these resources, again, you build up a program and a structure so that you have an RTI, but not just for literacy, but also for math. And then what they're doing now is spending valuable time um, just looking for resources that they can pull together to meet the needs of the students. Um, and then ho and hope that they're in line with the state frameworks. And so when you purchase a new program, one of the benefits of a new program is that it has this um, intervention system already incorporated in it. I did not even take into account what money is being spent on intervention materials. And what I don't want to see happen to a certain degree is because we lack the appropriate resources, we put kids on computer programs because it does, and, and there are some great ones out there, and believe me, there are some great interventions that are occurring with a computer-based type of interaction as far as curriculum, but it doesn't substitute strong teaching and, and good curriculum materials to do that teaching because what all the research says that teachers make the number one impact as far as, as learning. And, and we need to give them the right resources. And we need to give them the time to plan um, instead of looking for different materials. So. Well, I'll just say that in light of the teacher input especially, I don't want to see that um, line item go away. But that's just my hope. I found kind of an interesting thought after what you just said that studies have shown that the teacher is the one that has the most impact on a student. And I also heard at the beginning of our meeting with the three towns that the $600,000 would be um, a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers. And so how do we balance that? A math program in the hands of the teacher who doesn't have to go searching for things is much more effective. But we just have such a serious, serious situation here that um, some choices are going to have to be made that nobody wants to make. They're, they're all distasteful <coughs> to all of us. So we can support this, but the the bottom line is that some of the things that we want to support will have to be cut, I believe. Mr. Farmer. Go raise some more issues. Um, w within the original uh, budget paper that had a number of scenarios, reducing the professional development days by, by one was, was on the table. Um, one of the difficulties of cutting that is that once it's cut, it's very difficult to get back because you need to have the, uh, have the assets. Um, I have had some discussion with the, the president of the uh, Teachers Association at that time and not knowing the current circumstances and there wasn't time, I briefed her very briefly, sorry about that, I, I briefed her over a few minutes this afternoon so she was aware of the severity of the situation. The position at last time we spoke was that, that teachers might consider it if it was part of a package that reinstated all the potential teacher cuts, that that clearly is, is not on, on the, the agenda now. Um, nonetheless, it raises the question, given the severity, um, whether the committee should open a discussion to see whether that is something that, that would, would help. Um, the, the other thing I just want to say is that health insurance was raised at the, at the public hearing. My understanding is that the person who raised it, uh, who was a teacher uh, and not the treasurer of, of, of Rowley, um, had in mind um, an arrangement in which we would essentially give people a stipend for not taking our health insurance. And uh, Brian and I have talked about it. It has the same problem as an early retirement scheme in that if you give it to some, you have to give it to everybody. And there are a lot of people now uh, who, who um, um, already don't take uh, our insurance. We would have to give it 
to them as well as any people who, who are opted out. And, and we, we have looked at that and we don't see that as a, a viable proposition financially. Go ahead, Robin. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Um, I know another issue that was raised in regards to health care was the split that we have right now. Would it be possible to change that split rather than? You're talking actives or retirees? Wouldn't both. it be both? Um, uh, under 32B, under the, with a PEC, <coughs> that's absolutely, that's a, that is mandatory bargaining, the split. Um, there was an SJC ruling in February of just this year, last month, that said that um, a committee can unilaterally change the share for retirees up to a 50-50 split. Um, could, could I share my view <laughs> on that? I feel very strongly about it. And we agree. Um, it, it seems to me, and we, we agree, that, that people plan their retirement very carefully. Um, and to just unilaterally tell people that their, their contribution is being increased, I think is... The law, the law might make it legal, but it doesn't mean to say it's right. Uh, and, and equally, people approaching retirement ought to have the opportunity of replanning their retirement if that is something that we, we were going to do. Um, I, I think that <coughs> uh, I, I certainly value the relationship between the district as an organization and all our staff. Uh, and, and I think it's very disrespectful uh, to take unilateral action, even though the law says it's permissible. I, I agree with you, and I, I wouldn't suggest that at all. I, I'm thinking that if we could get the PEC together to just look at that piece of it, it do you think that would be possible, Brian, before? Uh, is it? It's possible, sure. But every, again, every member, in order for the PEC to reconvene, every member would have to say, yes, I'm willing to open the agreement right now. So, so if that one would be, says no, we're done. One person says no, we cannot which I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb, and this is Brian taking a guess, but I would imagine at least one would say no. I, I still think we should try. Yeah. I think we should ask the question. Mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah. Does anyone else on the committee have any suggestions or questions? And Based on Dina's recommendations, which I want to go on the record as saying um, I, I do support them as well, um, do we have a quick figure on what those, how, how much that would save right now? We, we, ha we have some, yes. Um, you may like to know that I met some of my central office colleagues earlier in the week and made it clear to them that it was highly likely that their jobs would, would come up for, for discussion. Uh, the, two, the two central office positions that have been referred to um, and I haven't tried to debate them, um, is $131,415. Um, what is not amongst this paperwork is that uh, we're able to um, um, re 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 repurpose some funds in Title II, um, which uh, would save $36,000. Uh, um, Adding back the, the high school staffing um, reduction would save $35,200. Um, the trouble is I'm talking now about some savings which are needed to deal with the, 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 the health insurance. Um, I, I, I think we've reached a stage actually where if, if you've given us guidance, we need an opportunity to go back and, and have, a, have a look at, at, at the, whole, the whole piece. Because I think you, you're probably going to have to do everything that you've talked about and more. Um, the other thing we need is, do you have any guidance as to where you want to pitch the highest assessment to a town? Because we, we, we need a framework in which to, to work, and without that guidance, you could always change it later uh, when you, you look at what could be a pretty long meeting next week. Does anyone have any suggestion as to the percentage <coughs> that would go to Rowley? We have, Christopher asked if we could come up with a percentage in the assessment increase to the towns, and since Rowley would be the highest of the three, um, it, it basically needs to be what's, what's the highest percentage increase that we would like them to work with.
Just to clarify, it, the missing, it goes five and a half, four and a half, four, three and a half, three. The missing piece in the middle would be a five. A flat five would be 380,000. This is the sheet of paper that would have some guidance as to those numbers. Just for clarification, um, we can give you that guidance, but when we come back next week and we see what that looks like, um, there is still obviously the opportunity next week to support or not support the cuts. Um, we're still operating at this point on the tentative operating number as our high number. We're obviously backing away from that, um, but we don't have to decide. Uh, we, we can give you the guidance of a ballpark, but when we see what that actually looks like and how that translates based on the cuts that have been recommended and the ones that you bring forward, we're going to have a long discussion next week about what that final number is. Okay. Dina, did you want to say something? I was just going to ask, um, I don't know if this would muddy the waters or not, but if we, because quite honestly, I would like to see what what would happen if we went to, I'd like to see two different scenarios, um, a four and a half and a five, personally. I, 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 it's going to be distasteful no matter what we do, um, but I'm hoping that if, if we, and I agree, Robin, we're going to have a long, length, lengthy discussion next week, but I would like to be able to see what what our worst case where we're, our worst case is, and maybe we can back down from that. I don't know. I. You're asking for a high assessment of four and a half and a high assessment of five and a, five. Yes, because Brian said he he said that five is not listed on here, and you said that was three. What did you say, Brian? Three. So a four and a half percent would be five oh seven five. That's there. Right. A five percent would be three hundred eighty thousand. So what's that, about 127,000 more? And I know I'm not making friends in Raleigh right now, but, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we, we, it's a very tough, I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around everything we just heard an hour ago, you know? It's, um, it's a very tough budget to do. And, and like I stated in our, our meeting with the town officials tonight, it's not that, we all live in the towns that we represent. We Nine of us represent the whole district, but we all are are living in Newberry, Raleigh, and Salisbury. We want police. We want fire. We want roads. We want all those services. So it's not, we don't want it pitted, us against them. Does anyone on the committee, excuse me, have a different um, number other than the 45 or 5%? Dick? Uh, I don't have a different number, but uh, I think the outcome will be the same no matter what number we pick uh, for assessment to rally. They, I, I think they have a number in mind that they can afford. And um, if two out of the three towns vote in favor of the budget and then Raleigh gets hit with that assessment, uh, a few years ago when I was a selectman, we had to have 23% cuts across the board in all of our services, which was extremely painful. And um, uh, unfortunately, this year already, we've had to cut a million dollars out of our budget from a $2.7 million budget increase to 1.7, and that's distasteful to everybody in this room. Uh, and it's just going to become more distasteful. Do you have any more input regarding the budget for the administration? I, I say it's going to be a fight. It will be a fight. I'm asking if you have any more input regarding no, the budget. No, no. Okay, thank you. Deb, can, can I actually amend that? I, I think if we look at a 4% a four and maybe a 4.5%, and, and, and I think we have to realize that even looking at this, the towns have acknowledged that we're probably looking at overrides, and I think that that's going to be the reality, as, as awful as it is, whether it be in one town or all three, it's, it's going to require work. So just to clarify, you're saying identify cuts, <coughs> additional cuts between 507 and 635,000 more in cuts, I'm correct? Looking, yeah. Okay. Linda? 
I think by coming up with these cuts, I think people will really see what the severity is of what these cuts are going to mean. And maybe people will start stepping up and going to their selectmen and going for these overrides. I don't think there's any question that none of us want this stuff to happen. Robin? And with regard to that, we don't have a lot of time. If we're presented with what a 4% and a 4.5% cut looks like, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and our eyes are seeing it for the first time and everyone else is seeing it for the first time, that is very difficult to process and deliberate about, and I know that is a lot of pressure with only a week to go to make those kinds of thoughtful, surgical um, decisions. So I'm wondering, will we have 24 or 48 hours notice maybe, for, and for the public and for the, everyone in the district? Okay. I mean, we, I think if we, I leaned over to Christopher earlier and said, if we focus less time on the, the, the final budget document, maybe not being the perfect narrative this year, but gives right. you all the data, I, I, yeah. yeah, I think we can get that Monday. Awesome. Can I just ask if there's anybody else who's looking at a different percentage? I don't want to be the one that's... Is there anybody else, that I, anybody else at the table want to see a different number? I'm feeling like if we go that <laughs> far back and that extreme, then we can always add back in and see what that begins to look like and do some figuring on the spot next Wednesday. But I would not, in good conscience, even ask you to, to go back no. beyond 4%. Uh, I agree with that. Suzanne? So are we going to have, like in years past, like scenario one, like for these numbers, or is this going to give us a budget with that number? Are we going to have like our current tentative budget, then we're going to have the four and the five, like the four and a half and the five, is that what you asked for? Of the four and the five. The four and the five, like separate out in the three, like in years past we've done that. I, I think what we'll be talking about will be a surrogate budget that was a summary of changes that then Brian could put in to the, the foundation document. We, we, we can't give you two or three full budgets. No, yeah. no, I, no, I, no, I understand so that. Like, yeah, like, summarize I guess, the changes. You know, and we've done it in the past. You know what I'm trying to, like, what Absolutely, done, yeah. yeah. Generally, Talking we're doing that in January and February, not What would be cut if, what, what cuts would there be at 4%? What cuts would there yeah, be at 4.5%? Yeah, yeah, like, like uh, you know, they usually kind of right next to each other, a serenary one, two, three. So I guess that's the question. Would you be comfortable voting a budget that we put one budget package together so you can vote and say, this is the budget package, you mm -hmm. know, the lines, all those here too. But if we then said, okay, here's three scenarios, and then the scenarios were something akin to these sheets, where you just basically had the assessments and the list of changes right. that yes. are effective in that document. Yes, and list of changes. That I think as the budget. Yes, okay. I think that's what we all want right. to see yeah, is what the what changes are. For, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask one other thing? I'm sure you would do this anyway, but could I recommend that in doing these scenarios that you also prioritize if we want to put things back, what you think should be put back first? You know, like we've always done, we've had a mm -hmm. must do, should do, can't do type situation. It doesn't have to be those three columns, but yeah. I'd certainly like yeah. to be able to see what in your, your, um, what your advice would be in, in what we should put back. Hopefully, we'll be able to do some of that anyway. Anyone else? Can, can we just establish whether you wish to enter into discussion around the uh, professional development day? No stone unturned, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. That was part of my recommendation. Because we might need to get some of you together quickly, um, P&N. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, say to the people who are here tonight and to the people who are perhaps watching tonight that um, this information needs to be um, disseminated so that people understand what the situation is. And, um, and it will be a long meeting next week. And, um, you know, we're, we're still here to listen at least until the 15th. <coughs> we, Paul? I actually just have one more thought I'd like to share with the administration, if that's okay. 
So if I understand correctly, Mr. Farmer, you're talking about going back with the PNN subcommittee to speak with the TRTA about trying to negotiate the Professional Development Day. Is that my understanding? Well, I, I, I would have a conversation with TRTA representatives to see if it was worth your coming to the table. And that Professional Development Day is part of an existing contract? Yes. Yes. So I want to take it a step further and, and ask this question. Is there any possibility of speaking to the TRTA about negotiating the percentage increase that they have for next year so that everyone feels some portion of the pain as opposed to some teachers feeling a lot of pain? If, if there was uh, no professional development day, every teacher would lose a day's pay. But yes, we could ask that question as, as well. Do you, want, you, you get what I'm saying, Brian? I don't. Well, it, I understand the teacher's got a percentage. About freezing steps and columns, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying change, change the, the contract, existing I mean, contract. Okay. Just, just to ask the question, that's all, because everyone here knows in the public, and it's in the newspapers, the kind of cuts that we're looking at, if we don't pass an override, it's going to devastate this district. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what savings could be, uh, you know, if, if instead of getting a 2% raise, it went to 1 or three quarters or one and a quarter. I don't know what savings that would make for the district, but I think it's something that we should have for information if they express any type of willingness to do that. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Suzanne? I just had one question. I know that, that Dina referred to um, pay cuts the administration. Um, would that be a uh, reduced work um, year? Or is there any in, anything in the administration that we can combine, uh, middle school, high school administrators, duties, things like that? I know that I'm not I'm not supporting it so, so much, but I know in years past that comes up, and with cuts like these, I know that someone's going to say, "Can't you get rid of, or can't you cut, or can't you combine some of the administrators?" And I just don't know, you know, uh, or can't you? like what Dina said, somehow reduce their pay, oh. um, work gear, whatnot. And I just didn't know if any of those could be explored. I'm not in support. I'm just saying that that I don't know if that's fully been looked at. Um, we, we, we will certainly look at that. Right. And I, I mean, I'm, it's um, not saying that you're not doing any of your jobs. I'm just, if, if, it's, if we're going to this, you know, these extreme mm -hmm. cuts, we have to kind of look at, it, at everything, unfortunately. Well, I think with the amount of money that's involved, uh, no stone unturned. Right. Everything has to be looked at. We, we, we currently have a, the prospect of wrapping two and a half people into the chief academic officer. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I've been in a conversation where if we'd merge the middle and the high school, this would be somewhat easier than, than it, is, it is now. Um, but we will, we will keep looking. Anything else? Okay, we do have another agenda item tonight. It was um, a supplemental agenda item. It is regarding high school graduation requirements. This is being brought up tonight because it is time sensitive. Uh, Mr. Farmer. Uh, th thank you. The review of the high school graduation requirements has been on the agenda for, the, for a while. Um, you clarified that this was something that we should try to do this year, um, that this is coming latest primarily my responsibility, uh, but I think snow days have, have helped. Um, the proposals that you have in front of you um, have essentially come from the, um, the high school school council. Um, that there have been uh, two meetings uh, that have included myself, uh, the assistant superintendent and the chief academic officer uh, with the, um, the high school principal. Uh, the director of guidance joined one of them, and I've had some bilateral uh, conversations with the um, um, the, the principal. You, you, you'll, you'll see if you look in the <coughs> below the third paragraph on the first page uh, that there are a number uh, of, of goals here. Um, too many students are spending too much time in, in study halls. Um, that does not help the culture of the high school as a learning or, or organization. It's particularly juniors and seniors. Um, the the core, the core subjects uh, are, are defined. Um, some choices provided for freshmen. Um, at the moment, it's biology or biology. Um, 
engineering is tested by MCAS in in uh, tenth grade, so it makes sense for having engineering as an alternative um, in in ninth grade. At the moment, um, the district requires two years of a world language. Um, that means people could take Spanish one year and French the next. That doesn't really make sense in terms of developing learning. Um, so, so the proposal requires it to be two years of the same language. And um, we, we've had four years of math for a little while now. Um, the changes recognize that, that not all students are going to be uh, able to go through the typical maths sequence in, in high school. Um, and, and so a, a, a number of uh, areas of learning which relate very strongly to math or require math skills, maybe of a more vocational kind, uh, will, be, will be included in the definition of, um, of math. Um, you, you'll see there's a, the, at the bottom of the page there's a listing there of the fact that they've looked at the Cape Ann League schools and quite a number of other uh, high schools to see what is going on uh, o o over there. So in detail over the page, students will be required to earn 22 Carnegie units rather than 21. Uh, Full-time students have to be enrolled in at least four of the five core academic courses. <coughs> All students in grades 9 through 12 must enroll in six full-time courses plus physical education. I should say that there is a discussion going on uh, along the lines that um, students who are taking four or more AP courses in one year um, could get a waiver to just take five uh, a a academic courses. I, I think that's sensible. Um, but it's a, a huge uh, work workload. At four, I've mentioned the engineering technology and five languages. There were, there were two proposals which, when we discussed them in detail, the school is not quite ready uh, to, to, to run with it. Um, and, and so these changes are, are not very substantial in number. Um, but, but I believe will create a, a set of opportunities for students uh, that will be rigorous, uh, that will require them to um, focus more on, on learning. Uh, I, I, I don't think that um, study halls are necessarily very useful for, for many students because they're, they're, they're not mature enough to kind of manage their, 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 own, their own learning. Um, so we're, we're asking you Technically, this should be a first reading um, because it is, it is policy. We're, we're asking you to approve this as a first reading, and if you do, we'll bring it back next week. Before we discuss, could we have a motion to um, approve the amendments to the high school graduation requirements as presented? I'll make a motion. Could we have a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, my question, I completely support the idea about too many study halls and the changes. My question is, um, if those students are no longer in study hall, I know that's still the body of the teacher that would be there. But if they're now in a class, I'm just wondering kind of what the numbers are, because as we're talking about the cuts and electives and everything else, now these students will be enrolled in a class most likely an elective as opposed to a core subject because we're already requiring them to be there. So do you have a sense of h how many sections that might need to be taught to offset the missing study halls? Well, um, we, we had a, a meeting with the principal specifically on this uh, item um, earlier today because I was ready to withdraw the revised graduation requirements if that was going to be a difficulty. Um, the, um, the principal has worked with the director of guidance to look at the distribution of juniors and seniors through classes at, at, the, at the present time. Um, uh, it, it's interesting that amongst the juniors, 126, which is 76% of juniors, requested six courses this year. Um, so so there's, there's a substantial body of um, juniors already in, in, in six classes. Um, amongst the seniors, 36 um, requested to be scheduled in at least six courses. The expectation is, is that we will have more students in the electives. And, and the principal feels comfortable that we can make this work. Dick? 
Uh, on item number four, uh, allowing the ninth grade student to take engineering, technology, or et cetera. A passing grade in either MCAS, technology, or biology meets the state requirement for graduation. Uh, what does that do in terms of the the these students' participation in the classroom with the teacher, if they realize that they could get an F, and, but if they do appropriately well on an MCAS test, uh, they still qualify for graduation credits? I'm not sure that I un understand the question. That would be true of any does, MCAS well, subject. I know, but it says a passing grade qualifies them for. So if they're in the classroom with their teacher and they're not doing satisfactory work but when it comes to the MCAS test they get a, um, a passing uh, you know they're they're they're, they're okay they're uh, what does that do for students in in the classroom for these courses well, it, you it motivates them you, you've opened up a can of worms because we then get into the revision of the grading system um, and, and I, I have questions if, if, if students are getting an F in class and they're passing MCAS, there's, there's something missing there and we need to address what's missing. If, if students are not doing the work, <coughs> they need to be required to do the work. If students are not attending, they need to be required to attend. Well, and and, and th those are areas where if a, a child is getting a zero because something's late, they can fail very easily. And you, I'll, I'll get on my soapbox if I'm not careful. I, but, but, but there's a linkage there. Can I just clarify? I think that the spirit of this, where it says a passing grade in either MCAS technology, is to, to say that this is basically aligning with what the MCAS is already saying, that for, for MCAS, for a graduation, you do pass one of these, so it's just putting, it's aligning that requirement. I know. I'm a, I'm a traditional educated individual, and I look at it as uh, if you're proficient in an MCAS, but you're participating in a classroom environment with a teacher who's working very hard for all of their students to uh, do the work um, and uh, be cooperative in the class at the same time. Uh, I think it's a demotivating factor for many of the other students to say, well, I don't have to do the homework. If I get the MCAS test, if I, if I get a proficient, then hey, I'm okay, and I can graduate. That's, that's my perspective on it. But you well, can't we graduate. had a discussion yes. at, at the did. start of the school okay. year, and I think we agreed <laughs> to differ. Could we, okay, is there anything on this specific policy, Dina? Can I ask another question? Um, this does not address our hope of using a waiver for PE for uh, juniors and seniors, is that correct? It, it does not. We, we may come back to you with, with that. Um, we have been doing some work on, on a PE waiver uh, for students who are um, very active in athletics. If, they are, if they're on a team, they're probably doing at least 100 hours of, uh, of physical activity and developing physical skills, whereas a um, a typical class is about 64 hours, um, and we, we, we know that we have some students who would prefer to be taking an academic course uh, rather than um, when they're in the ju junior and senior year, uh, ra rather than PE. Um, we, we left it at the last discussion um, that we would look to see whether or not we, had a, we would have a pilot arrangement for sen just for seniors. Okay. My other question is, um, and I know this isn't in our usual policy form, but in the policy it will state that it begins at such and such year. I mean, we're looking to implement this starting next year, correct? So that it won't, meaning the freshman. It doesn't disadvantage any students who are Exactly. That's enrolled. what I want to make clear, that f it starts with the freshman year next year. Okay. I have one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned in the four-year math program that there would be students normally don't go through physics and chemistry and calculus, et cetera. Uh, what that means that you would have to or offer different courses and provide maybe not the same teachers for the, what, what are you looking for in terms of the vocational math courses for those students that don't want to go through that four year period? We, we, we have accounting, for example, would, would be what one such course. At the moment, statistics is not regarded as a, as a math subject. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, we've got we've got some. Well, one of the committees looking very puzzled. Well, 
if you're a pure mathematician, applied math is, is a, a different subject. Are there any more questions on the policy as presented for a first reading? We have a motion. I mean, could we have a vote? All in favor? First reading. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Could we have a motion to adjourn this meeting? I make the motion. Second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much.